Several years ago, a group of scientists and psychologists were studying the effects of addiction on humanity. And they were specifically focusing on the uh, issue of heroin. It's a heroin epidemic going on not just in the United States, but around the world. And they made a couple of surprising discoveries. Discovery number one was this. For any of you who maybe have been in a hospital, you had a hip or a little bit of pain, part of the medicine you were given was 100% pure heroin. Now, uh, some of you younger folks, maybe your grandma went in, she had a knee replacement, a hip replacement. Grandma didn't come out addicted, did she? The heroin was used to uh, deal with the pain, to deal with the issue, and then you get out of life and, and your body is recovering both physically and it's no longer dependent on the medication, and you do not have a dependency issue. So then they can figure out if the pure stuff, the best stuff was being done for the medical effect in the hospitals, what was going on on the street? And so they began to test it and they found out that the heroin that people get addicted to is not the pure stuff. There's actually very little pure heroin in it. It's all the other stuff that gets mixed in that actually has an addictive effect. And so they decided to figure out why it's addictive and what the ramifications are. And so like many uh, scientific groups, they started a study of rats. And what they did is they took uh, several rats and put each of them in individual cages. And then they put water uh, receivers in there, and one of them had 100% pure heroin coming through the water, and others that had the street heroin coming through the water. And they noticed that virtually none of these rats in their individual cages drank any of the water that had pure heroin in it. Almost all of them exclusively drank the water that, was, that had the stuff placed in it from the streets. And then they noticed something else. They noticed that the longer they were in the cages, the more of it they drank until some of them eventually um, overdosed themselves into Jesus' arms. And then they said, well, why is it they do that? And so one of the other psychologists and a group of scientists built this thing that they literally called Rat Park. It was like heaven for rats, okay? And uh, they had, they put dozens and dozens and dozens of rats in this larger space and they gave them their food and all the stuff that rats do in their social lives and then they put water receptacles in there. They put regular water, they put water laced with 100% pure heroin and they put water laced with the street level heroin. Are you still with me? And here's what they found. No rats drank the 100% pure heroin laced water. Very, 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 very few rats drank any of the water that was the street type of. None of them drank it to excess. None of them overdosed. They just did their normal rat routines with normal rat community activities, drinking water when they needed it, eating food when they needed it, and not a single one of them overdosed. When you live in community, your life has purpose. It has extended meaning. It has extended uh, opportunities. It, it has the kinds of things that bring us together. And then when you have purpose in life, purpose produces bonds and relationships with others, even in rats. And these, these psychologists went on to understand that those types of behaviors that they found in rats also are similar types of behaviors that they find in humankind. And it doesn't just have to be heroin. When we think of addictions, we think of primarily two things, right? We think of drugs and alcohol, right? And so we, we have all these things we do with that. And yet many Americans are addicted to all kinds of other things. We don't like to talk about it, but some of us are addicted to sweets and some of us are addicted to caffeine. I'm starting a new group for caffeine to addicted people tonight. Some of us are addicted to our iPhones. And I don't mean just 15-year-olds or 20-year-olds. Some of you, if we were to take your iPhones away from you for a week, you would end up in some type of an infirmary. <laughs> and yet here's the thing. Technology has a way of impeding the purpose of community. Here's one of the things that, that, that going back 
to the 1950s, they began to study and found on coming out of that stuff on these racks, is that it's your real friends, folks, not your Twitter friends, not your Facebook friends, not your group text friends. It's your real friends who are going to show up in your hour of need. It's your real friends who are going to pray with you when struggle strikes, when cancer hits, when your marriage is in the tank. It's your real friends who are going to do life with you. But what they've learned since then is this. This idea of real friends with real communities sharing and doing life together with purpose that have bonds that cannot be broken be, have begun to decline since the 1950s while the amount of square footage in the average American home has increased in that same time frame. And as we stand here this morning, October 27, 2019, uh, sociologists are proclaiming that the United States of America is considered the loneliest culture in all of human history. And so I found myself thinking, just maybe, the opposite of addiction is not sobriety. The opposite of addiction is community. Because when we isolate, we get into things that harm us, that shame us, that embarrass us. But when we do life together, we have a tendency to, to raise the level, the water level raises, all the boats raises, right? That we have a tendency to do those kinds of things together. And so there are a couple of thoughts there at the outset if you want to grab your notes in the middle of your worship folder. A couple of preliminary thoughts to orient our thinking before we jump into Mark chapter 2. Here's one of those thoughts. People choose isolation when our souls are designed for community. People choose isolation when our souls are designed for community. It's okay to disconnect every once in a while. It's okay to let your RPMs come down and let your get an emotional, a mental, a physical respite. And that's good for a moment. But it's harmful in the long run. And large segments of culture have figured this out. How many of you have a gym membership? How many of you actually use that gym membership? Now we've come to about half. But gyms have figured this out. That's why you go to an average gym, and they've not only got all the exercise equipment, but they've got a juice bar, and they've got a little place where you can hang out over here, and, and they make the locker rooms more appealing and put screens in there. Because people will come to the gym, they'll do their exercise, but then they'll just hang out because people are sharing and understanding a common bond but around exercise. Sports communities have figured this out. That's why you can go up into in my community in Scottsdale, depending on what restaurant you go to, this would be like a Vikings restaurant or an Ohio State restaurant or a Notre Dame restaurant, and they gather together around a common purpose, a common cause. When Starbucks burst onto the scene and started taking America by storm about 15 or 17 years ago, they used to have a little folder that sat there by the coffee creamer and all the stuff that people put in their coffee so it's not really coffee, right? And it was, a, it was a brochure because they were trying to hire people. And the brochure literally said this, the, the line across the top, I, I grabbed one years ago and I've kept it all these years. It says, Starbucks, create community. It went on to say that you could make a difference in someone's day. That when you came to work at Starbucks, what you were really doing is not serving coffee, but you were creating an environment where neighbors and friends can get together and reconnect while enjoying a great coffee experience. And they call that the Starbucks experience. Not bad for a company whose primary commodity is beans, right? <laughs> but they weren't talking about selling coffee, they were talking about creating community. And here's what rats and Christians have in common. You've been wondering all week since you saw that email, haven't you? I'm going to write this down. It's not in your notes. Rats and Christians are alike because both species thrive in community, but we decline in isolation. Rats and Christians are alike because both species thrive in community, but we decline in isolation, which leads me to that second thought there in your worship folder. What makes the difference is this. Community means you care more about others than you do yourself. Community is a little bit about denying yourself and coming together for the common good of others. So with that as a backdrop, what I'd like us to do is I'd like us to dive a little bit deeply into 
Mark chapter 2, the opening verses there. Are you guys ready for this? If you're ready or not, here I come. Uh, it's the story about uh, a group of guys who had a friend who was lame. He was paralyzed, actually. And Jesus had been teaching throughout Capernaum. He's cast out demons. He's healed all these people. And he comes into this, this community. And he goes into a house. And people pack the house so tight that people can't get in. Nor can anybody get out. Then they pack around all the windows. And they pack around all the doors. So nobody can even get close. So this pretty entrepreneurial, enterprising group of guys decide that they want to help their friend meet Jesus. But there are too many of these friends. So they got four of them to carry him on a little thing. They go up on the roof. They destroy this roof. And they lower a man to meet Jesus. And here's what the Bible says about this. Now Jesus enters Capernaum and the people heard that he had come home. And they gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left. Not even outside the door as he preached the word to them. And some men came. Now understand, this is a group of men. Sometimes we think it's just four. This was like a, 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 like a whole men's group who came with this guy. And bringing him uh, to him a paralyzed man that were carried by four of them. And since they could not get into Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it and then lowered the mat the man was lying on. Now, in your worship folder, you see there where it says uh, and it was carried by four of them? Underline that phrase. Because here's what I want you to understand. There's this whole group of friends. They all can't get near Jesus. So they just have four of them carry this guy in there. Here's what I want you to understand. It's so important about this. These friends did whatever it took to get their friend to Jesus. They didn't take no for an answer. They didn't let common barriers uh, keep them out or intimidate them. They did whatever it took to get their friend to Jesus. Now in verse 4... It says there was the crowd, right? Now here's what I've come to understand about churches, about the meaning of community, about what was the difference between things going on when Jesus was doing this kind of stuff and the kind of things that are going on in the American church today. See, you had a whole crowd there to observe. But when you live in community, you don't observe, you serve. See, these guys were all, this crowd was all observing Jesus and hearing what Jesus had to say and looking what he might have to say or he might have to do that would benefit them. But these men who lived in community, these men who cared about their friend, came together and they served. They served him. And that's the difference between church and movement. A church is static. A church sits on their butts and listens to somebody sing and somebody speak and goes home and has lunch and then comes back and does it again the next week. But a community comes together and we worship the living God. We have an encounter and experience with Jesus. And we're not selfish people, so we do whatever it takes to bring as many people as we have to through those doors or through the roof or through the windows so that they too can have an encounter with Jesus. And when you do that, and you do it in community, and you do it unselfishly, and you do it for the benefit of others, then you get a movement, not church. Do you see the difference? And that's what Christ is calling us to. And so here's the first thing I want you to understand. Community opens up your world. It opens up your world in every possible way. It opens up your world financially. Because if you're going to live in community, you can't just live for yourself. You can't live selfishly. You have to live generously, right? Sometimes that means giving money to causes or to situations. Sometimes that means paying for somebody else's meal. Sometimes that means inviting people into your house where you're going to cool it a little better. You're going to clean it a little nicer. And you're going to cook something that's a little more tasty. Sometimes it costs financially. That's part of community. But it opens you up to this idea of generosity. Community opens up your world emotionally because if you're going to share with other people at some point in line you're going to have to cross that line of transparency yourself right you're going to have to be real you're going to have to share that means you're putting yourself emotionally at risk you can be hurt or you can hurt it opens up your heart generously it opens up your life experientially there's something to be said about having shared experiences and you don't get shared experiences in isolation. For those of you who are watching online, maybe you live in another part of the world, you can't get here. But find a church 
where you can get involved in a movement that does things experientially, whether it's serving the poor, whether it's working with marriages, whether it's helping teenagers, whatever it takes, get some gathered experiences together because those gathered experiences become the foundation on which you build movements. You still with me? Let me know that every once in a while because I can't see you. It happens collectively, it happens communally, and let's just be real, real honest about it. We had our great opening last week, and I want you to understand that Connect Church loves you. We love and honor the people who help us get here. We love and honor the people who serve in this congregation and in this community, but I want you to understand we are also making decisions based on the needs of the people who are not here yet. That's how community opens you up to the world. See, sometimes I can get so focused on David that I can miss what God is doing all around me. That's why it's important for somebody wired like me to be a part of a community, to be a part of Connect Church. That's why this congregation exists. That's why we serve. That's why we invite. Because this is real important. If you're not connected to something bigger than yourself, all you have to offer others is yourself. And when that happens, think about the American church, not just Connect Church, okay? When that happens, it becomes really, really easy to leave when you don't get your way, your feelings get hurt. And it becomes harder and harder to stay. When you don't live in community, when you live in isolation, even sitting in this room, you can live here isolated. It becomes really easy to leave and really hard to stay when things don't go your way. As a matter of fact, I think that is one of Satan's most powerful tools in the American church. That people bounce from church to church and place to place and Bible study to Bible study because they don't have any real community. They're living life in isolation. And it's actually a form of selfishness and self-centeredness because you've never put down any roots. You don't have any skin in the game. You've never taken on the understanding of a movement about the greater need. It all focuses on you. Still love me? Community means we're in this together. Community means when you hurt, I hurt. Community means when you rejoice, I rejoice. Community means when you're scared, I'm scared. Community means that we don't walk alone. We do it together. I had the privilege a few years ago of going to the Redwood National Forest and the uh, Sequoia National Park. It looks a little bit like this. Hey, have y'all ever been there? You see that guy whose wife is taking the picture apparently? How small he looks next to those trees? Now, if you've ever been through those forests, and I've had the privilege to do that on a couple of occasions, they're amazing. I mean, they're like, this, you know, I can't get my arms even around a few feet of them. They're incredible, and, and they just seem to go to the sky. But here's one thing you'll, never, you'll notice as you go through those. Virtually never do you see one falling over. Virtually never do you see the effects of some kind of storm that's blown through and knocked over one of those trees like a monsoon does around my house, like, all the time. And yet you've got these things that are like hundreds and hundreds of feet high and, and they're all big around. Why is that? Because their strength is not in what you see. Their strength is in what you don't see. And it looks like this. That's the root system. Now those roots don't go down, you know, hundreds of feet the way they go up hundreds of feet. But what you would learn if there's a little bit of a study is that the roots of the average redwood or sequoia tree actually extend outward literally a hundred miles. And in the process, as you can see, they become this tangled weeds of a whole bunch of roots from a whole bunch of trees, right? Now it's way prettier on the top, would you agree? And yet the real substance, the real meaning, the reason they withstand the storms in life, the reason you don't see them hardly ever knocked over or blown over by the strong winds and the storms is because their roots are interconnected for hundreds of miles. One might be standing on a perfect day at 25 or 30 or 70 miles. There could be a huge storm blowing, but the roots of the ones standing here on the calm day are intertwined with the ones where the storm is blowing, and they hold each other up. And in the church, 
If we're going to have movement, if we're going to have real community, if we're going to impact the 85205, some of us have to appreciate that it's going to take some roots. Because as a congregation, as a community, as the city of Mesa, there are going to be some storms come our way. Sometimes there are going to be some monsoons that will blow through even a congregation like this one. Or somebody doesn't get their way, or somebody gets their feelings hurt. But when you're sharing the same roots, when the winds blow and the storms come, when feelings get hurt, when things you've done get discarded or not used, doesn't mean you don't matter. It means you matter all the more because it's the rootedness. Now, how do we do that? We do that for sure through our connection groups. If you're new here today and you're not in a group, or if you've been around for several months and you're not in a group, you go out to our group's kiosk. There's an iPad there. You can pull up every single group that this church offers. You can hit on one, and it'll say where it is in proximity to your house. If it's too far away, you hit on another one. You say you want to go to that one. Your group leader will get an email. They're going to email you before you go to bed tonight, saying, here's what our group meets. We want you here. Not bad for a church that just opened last week, right? <laughs> But it takes that kind of connection, the kind of community. Because Satan's greatest force is to make you feel isolated. And when you feel isolated, then he starts chipping away at your emotions and you start drinking the laced up heroin water. And your perspective gets skewed and your eyes get blurry and your faith gets weak. And you can't stand the travails of life. Then when you have a real issue, not somebody hurt your feelings, not somebody sat in your seat, not somebody drank the bottle of water you wanted, but when you have a real tragedy, when your marriage is on the rocks, when cancer is discovered in your body, when, you're, when your boss says it's been nice, but you're out of here, then you've got a system where somebody else is rooted in the same place you are, and you can have shared experience, and when the wind's blowing in your life, this person over here can stand steadfast knowing that they're holding you up. That's community. That's the church of Jesus Christ at its best. Those are the kinds of things that God is leading us to. Now the story continues. It doesn't stop there. Go to the next slide. It says, when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, son, your sins are forgiven. Now let's just hit the pause button. You've got this guy. We don't know why he's paralyzed, but his legs are paralyzed and he can't get himself around He's heard about Jesus, this great healer, and his friends bring him in to meet Jesus, and it's a pretty grand opening, wouldn't you agree? They don't know how to make an entrance. And the guy comes to Jesus. Do you think the first thing on his mind is his sins? Now, when Jesus said these words, that guy's going, are you kidding me? I, I went to synagogue last week. I helped feed the homeless. Are you kidding me? Why in the world, when I'm laying here with this obvious need before you, are you concerned about my sins? Here's the reason. What good is your health if your soul is dead? What good are the legs of the work that allow you to walk out of Jesus' presence and never really have anything else that's going to sustain the rest of your life? See, Jesus always begins with the important things first. And he says, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the teachers of law were sitting there and thinking to themselves, why does this guy talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Now, Mark doesn't go into all the detail, but you have to just do a little bit of cursory historical reading. You find out all kinds of stuff. You know a little bit about Capernaum. You know a little bit about the region. It wasn't like this guy... Whatever his condition was that caused the paralysis in his legs had just stayed around watching Oprah all day, right? I mean, he had spent a lot of his time going to doctors and they didn't tell him what was wrong. He'd gone to witch doctors and they tried all of their potions and all of their magic and they couldn't fix what was wrong. Kind of like a lot of people in life, he had tried everything else that the culture, that the community, that the world has to offer and nothing fixed his situation. And then he encounters a group of men. I don't know if they met like on Wednesday night at a taco shop or what. But he encounters this group of men who decide that they're going to help him. Who decide that they care about him. 
who decided, hey, this guy's life matters, and we're going to fight with him and for him. We're going to begin to look out for him. And with that as a backdrop, you have to understand that your faith impacts others because community is not individualistic. So it leads me to my second thought is this. Community elevates hope. In fact, I would add this parenthetically. Community elevates hope parenthetically when you don't have hope. See, the secret to Jesus being able to forgive this man's sins and the rest of the story that's about to take place comes with the understanding that there were a group of men who gathered around this guy and they went, hey, I know that your legs are paralyzed. I know that you can't walk. But you're not going to spend the rest of your life like that. Not on my watch. Not while I have something to say about it. You have to understand that your paralysis is not your identity. Some of us in this room, some people who call Connect Church their, their home, somewhere along the line, you've got to grasp with an appreciation that your despair is not your identity. Your addiction is not your identity. Your bitterness is not your identity. The envy you have towards others is not your identity. You're just being healed in transition. These guys are like, no, this isn't going to happen on my watch. See, his friends didn't see him for the circumstances that he was in. They saw him for the future that he could have. And when they say your paralysis, paralysis is not your identity, that means that there's something more at play, something more that they can be a part of, something more that they can bring them home to. Let me give you an example. Any of you ever been part of like a group text message and you didn't want to be? Yeah. Right? And you get lumped in with a family thing or a work thing, and you just aren't interested. And, and have you ever left the group? Now, you know when you leave the group, everybody else gets this little note that says, David's left the group, right? You ever have somebody else that will bring you back into the group? On one hand, it's really annoying, right? On the other hand, it represents a certain persistence of a message that they believe is important. And in the same kind of way, that's what these guys are saying here. They're saying, hey, this isn't going to happen on my watch. We're not going to give up on you. We're going to make sure that you meet Jesus, even if the circumstances are a little too heavy, even if the crowd's a little too large, even if it looks like under normal circumstances you can't get there. We're not living for what is normal. We're living not for what's natural, but we're living for what's supernatural. We'll do whatever we have to do to get you into Jesus because your identity is going to be found in Him. These guys are like, we're not going to settle for the fact that the crowd's too big. You can't see in the windows. You can't even see in the door that's spilling out into the streets. We're not going to settle for that. Where there's a will, there's a way, right? And this is my dream, folks. This is part of my saying yes. If you really want to have an experience with Jesus, if you really want more out of life than you're achieving on your own, I want you to understand that Connect Church will never give up on you. But you have to choose to stay in a safe place. See, you have to understand that this place is safe even if you begin to drift. And you have to make that decision. As a matter of fact, the best thing for some of us in this room to do is to determine in our hearts today that we're not only saying yes to Jesus, but we're saying yes to this fellowship. Well, if you can't say yes to this fellowship, whatever fellowship you need to go to so you can say yes. That way, when the storms come, when the winds blow, when the difficulties arise, you're already rooted in your understanding that I'm staying here. This place is safe. I'm not in this just for myself. There are other people who are in this with me, who are for me, and will do whatever it takes to help me through this. Otherwise, you won't stay when you begin to drift. Because what happens? When you begin to drift and life begins to take shots at us, sometimes we feel ashamed. Sometimes we feel embarrassed. Sometimes we just want to run. Let me give you an example. I can do this because it hasn't happened here. Well, actually it has. 
I've been in ministry now, pastoral ministry, for 30 years. I have never one time in any church, in any location that I've pastored in the United States, sat with a couple whose marriage was going through the test, was going through the rocks, they were talking about breaking up. Sat with them, prayed with them, coached them through some spiritual and marital understanding, had them find health in their marriage again, and then within two weeks, no more than a month, they leave the church. Every single time. Not 99 out of 100, not 99.9 out of 100, 100% of the time. When I've helped a couple going through marital struggles, find marital health, they always leave the church within two to four weeks. Why? Because I now know their secrets. And the enemy causes them to feel ashamed. The enemy causes them to feel embarrassed. They never said yes ahead of the storm. So when the storm comes, they had their roots. Their roots were not entangled with yours or with mine. And they began to run off. And they risk isolation going through the same issues all over again. Every single time. See, for this to be a safe place where communities established, where roots run hundreds of miles emotionally and spiritually and mentally, for you to withstand the storm, for a group of people will stand around you and say, your life's not going to fall apart on my watch. I'm going to pray with you. I'm going to spend time with you. I'm going to do meals with you. I'm going to share activities with you. I'm going to have experiences with you. But for you to have all of that, you have to say yes before the storm hits. Because if you wait till the storm hits, you'll get blown out of there. That's what the Bible's teaching us. It happens. Now, here's what's interesting. If I'm talking to a gentleman in this room and you share with me that you have cancer or you've lost a job, if I was talking to a female in this room, you share with me that you had this health scare or maybe you had a miscarriage or maybe you're dealing with the scars of an abortion during your teenage years. If, I, if I'm talking to a teenager in here and they have a friend who died and this teenager's hurting, or mom and dad are going through a tough time with their marriage and this teenager's hurting, if I'm talking to someone in here with cancer's discovered in your body, or you've been in an accident, you can come and we'll talk and we'll pray. And we'll pray for God's healing's touch. We'll pray for those kinds of things. You have no problem telling me that you have this physical thing. That you've got this job thing. But when it comes to some of the spiritual things in our lives, when it comes to some of the doors on our heart that still have a keep out sign, we decide that it's better to run and hide from those. And it's easier to share something about cancer, something about heart disease, something about an ailment and an ankle from an accident you had years ago than it is to be real about what's going on in your life. And when lines, unless you're real about what's going on in your life, you never have community. I don't mean you have to air your dirty laundry to everybody. That's why we have small groups. That's why we do these things somewhat selectively. But you'll never get ahead. You'll never get those things going on. You'll never have real community. You'll always struggle with the concept of community. Now, Jesus didn't leave the man there. Here's, here's what Jesus did. The next passage says, Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this is what they were thinking, talking about the, the religious leaders. And he said to them, Why are you thinking these things? Which is easier, to say to this paralyzed man, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and take up your mat and walk. Now, get in there for just a second. Go back. Now, read verse number 9 with me again. Some of you have read that and you've never really processed it. You've just read it as kind of a qualifier in story. Jesus says, which is easier, for me to forgive sins or for me to heal this man? Well, since the forgiveness of sins is 100% invisible, and nobody can see it, nobody can qualify it, there's no real accountability, right? The man can go back out and pretend he's sitting, Jesus said, well, I forgave him, but he chose to go on that lifestyle. 
Nobody really knows. But what if Jesus says these words? I'm going to heal you. So get up and walk. Now all eyes are on him in that moment, right? Because that's a whole different understanding of the power of God. See, sometimes in my life and sometimes in your life, God has to take our circumstances, best understood in community, and allow things that are visible to manifest His power because the community can't see the invisible that's changing from the inside out yet. Does that make sense? And that happens in all kinds of ways. I'm not saying the problem you have with your marriage or with your health or with your job or with your kids or whatever is God's fault. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying sometimes when you bring those things to God, especially in a safe place like this, what God's only doing in your heart and in your life is you're attempting to make changes, then gets manifested in the physical realities that are more tangible. Now let's go on with this. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. And so as an understanding that he can forgive sins, Jesus then says to the man, get up, take up your mat, and go home. And so the man got up, took his mat, walked out, and here it is, underline this, in full view of them all. Now this amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. Never seen anything like this. So this is my third thought for you. Community makes your life unexplainable. See, based on this scripture, community makes God's majesty visible so that it's in full view of everyone because there's no other explanation. This man had gone to the doctors, he'd gone to the witch doctors, he had tried every potion, every medicine, every salve, everything they could think of, and nothing had healed him of his paralysis. And most of us, like I said a minute ago, we're okay with physical healing, cancer. But when it comes to ideas about our marriages or ideas about our addictions or our struggles, we are not okay with people knowing that, with God manifesting himself in that. And what about here at Connect Church? Here's what I want you to understand. Whether your issue is a physical issue, a spiritual issue, a mental health issue, an emotional health issue, if you hide your healing in the shadows, people will never get to see it in the light. And the kingdom of God doesn't get to celebrate the goodness of God. See, community makes your life unexplainable because when that begins to happen, you're not who you used to be and people can't explain it. People who, have, who you have become in that process. That's why when I think about how that works individually, I can't help but think about how that works collectively. As we did our grand opening last week, and now we're having these 10 weeks of grand opening that are going to culminate on Christmas Eve. If all of this is true and what God's doing, and community really does make a difference, what will be the unexplainable impact of this little startup church 10 weeks from now? We're filling this room for a couple of Christmas Eve services. When we get to go out to Pause de Cristo and the Phoenix Rescue Mission and New Hope Community Center and Sunshine Acres, and we get to take our community into that community and we begin to help make a difference collectively. When you decide that it's time to get real, that you've struggled in a fruitless, faithless marriage for way too long, you decide it's time to get real about that and put some roots down and say yes. When you've struggled with a hidden addiction for so long that not even the person sitting next to you knows about, but you decide it's time to get real about that and you say yes. When you struggle with a, a physical infirmary, something that you just don't want the world to know, you don't have to tell the whole world, but you have to decide to say yes and let somebody know that somebody can take you and walk alongside you, they can have faith on your part, they can do the kinds of things that you wish you could do until you're in a position to do those, and they'll walk with you whatever it takes. Community makes our lives unexplainable. It doesn't happen in a crowd. It doesn't happen in isolation. And do you know that sometimes the loneliest place you can be is a crowd? 
Several years ago, I was uh, co-leading a group of uh, pastors to Kenya to, to do some stuff on behalf of an organization called Compassion International. But a small handful of us, about six of us, uh, went early and we spent a couple of days in the UK and we were doing some conference and seminar type training for pastors in London. And after we had finished the day of training, we were hanging out down in the theater district of London. And uh, we were doing some sightseeing and, and going to do some other stuff. And we were standing at an intersection at about 6 o'clock at night, right outside the train station. And it was really, really crowded. You know what I mean? You're never alone in London, right? And as the light turned, my friends and I started to go across the street, except I got this perfect shot of this one exhibit that I wanted to get a picture of. And so I stopped for like three seconds and took the picture. And when I turned around, my friends were gone. <laughs> now, I am surrounded literally by hundreds of thousands of people. And I never felt more alone in my life. So I walked on across the street to see if they had stopped and waited on me. They had not. And then I didn't know what I was going to do. Then I remember my mom, when I was like a little guy, every time she'd take us out Christmas shopping in the big city. If, you, if we get separated, stay in the last place where we were together and I'll come find you. And so I did that. First time in my life I've ever had to. But I'm standing there thinking, well, what if they don't come back? I have no idea where my hotel is. I have no idea which train's going to get me there. I have no phone numbers for anybody. In fact, I didn't even have my cell phone on me. And I stood there for probably 20 minutes, but it felt like about two hours, you know what I mean? With literally hundreds of thousands of people walking past me. Not one of them said, hey, you look lost American, can I help you? <laughs> Not one of them say, hey, I saw your friends, they went over there, I'll go get them for you. Hundreds of thousands of people, I'm standing there among them, lost, no idea where I am, or how to get to anywhere. About 20 minutes, maybe 25, I saw two of the guys from my group come walking back across the street. Those men are ugly, but I wanted to kiss them. <laughs> you know what I mean? And they're like, what happened? And I gave them the story. They said, well, come on, we're holding the cats. So I went, got the cat. Everything was fine. But I didn't have any community. And if you think about that in a spiritual sense, are we sometimes, especially those who have been in church for years or decades, while we think about the local church and Jesus, there are a lot of people in the 85205 who have hundreds of thousands of people they pass on their way to work or in their schools or in their gym or in Starbucks or whatever their day holds. And no one is doing life with them. And they don't know where to find that kind of hope. And I think Connect Church has to choose to intentionally be the kind of covenanted community in a city of thousands where we can find our friends who are lost and who are scared and don't know where to turn and don't know where to go. And we can find them and we can invite them into our community and through our community and save them in the arms of Jesus Christ. Would you agree? And in the outset of this passage when it says when Jesus saw their faith, the men who brought the paralyzed man, that's exactly what he was talking about. That they believe so much in him, they care so much about others, that their faith made the difference in this man finding Jesus and being healed both internally and externally, as opposed to spending the rest of his life in the circumstances and the consequences of where he was. And that's what we do around here. We create a safe environment for people to come in and they can hear about who Jesus is and as a song we sang earlier about how much he loves them. How unfailing his love is. And while they figure some of this stuff out, our faith will stand in the gap and begin building roots for them that eventually they'll attach to. So when the storms come, they know Jesus is real. And so, Father, rats and Christians have a lot in common. 
when we isolate, it leads to destruction. But when we live in community, we begin to thrive. And God, we're striving to be a safe place for people to find the hope of the Savior named Jesus. But sometimes that starts with us stepping out of our comfort zones. It starts with us inviting folks in. It starts with us taking the time to wear a wristband that starts a conversation in our favorite restaurant or standing in line at the movie theater or sitting at Starbucks or sitting in the lunchroom. And we get to tell people, why church? Because church is all about a community of people who do life together, who share meals together, who walk through life's storms together. Church is all about the true reflection of the love and the grace and the mercy of Jesus Christ and His power manifested among us. So that when I hurt, you hurt. But maybe there's something, a strength in my soul that can stand firm in that moment and I can carry you when I need to. That my roots will hold you up when your roots aren't quite deep enough or entangled enough. There are a lot of pretty trees in that forest and there are a lot of pretty people or attractive people or appealing people or successful people who look good on the outside above the ground but the roots in their lives are just non-existent. And you're asking some of those folks in this room this morning to say yes before they ever have to go into the struggles of life. So when they do, there's already a, a safety net. There's already a group of people whose faith will see them through that moment. God, we love you. We adore you. We give you all praise and adoration in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen.